Yay, everyone's so excited. And over on the other side of the room, hi. Hi, there we go. Make sure you make it really awkward when people walk in the door, just everyone stare right at them. Because it's really awkward to walk in during a talk in the front of a room. So let's make it extra awkward for anyone else that walks in. I'll stop and look with you. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago where, um, I mean, I normally get kind of weird in the middle and people get up and leave. And um, uh, I managed to rivet most people's attention for a goodly long time. About 40 minutes in, some dude got up and left. And I called him out on it. It was like 2,000 people in the room. And I called the guy out, and it turned around. It was a client of mine. It was like, oh, hey, like, <laughs> bad time to be an asshole. Like, that's, that's cool. So I um, appreciate you all joining me on a talk that ostensibly doesn't have a lot to do with security. But um, I think it'll be interesting, and I'll get you to a place where we talk about security. Uh, first, for um, those that don't know me, I, talk, uh, I start all my talks exactly the same way, telling you not to believe anything that I'm about to tell you. Uh, I am um, an autodidact, didact, didact. I had that on my, I saw somebody called, a lot of people on Twitter called themselves this. I didn't know what it meant. I eventually went and looked it up. And then I put it on some slides and I spelled it wrong for like a good six months. So it was an autodidact, which is not a word. And I felt so cool because I'm like, I know what autodidact means, but I didn't know how to spell it, which really was ultimate I irony of being a self-taught person was not how, knowing how to spell self-taught. So um, I... <laughs> I'm self-taught in the sense that uh, I went to school for a while. I spent four years going to school in Fairbanks, Alaska. I dropped out, never graduated, um, really wasn't even close to graduating. Uh, pulled cable and never declared a major. I was literally just going to school and fucking around for four years. Um, it was a lot of fun. I met my wife there, so it worked out, but everything else was kind of a cluster. So ended up uh, working, pulling cable in coal mines and doing work above the Arctic Circle. Uh, ended up running system and network operations for the largest ISP in Alaska, eventually got into security, did a lot of software security work for private industry and AppSec space, I worked for Sigital for a while, uh, ended up at Booz Allen, ran uh, some Intel labs for them around wireless and high assurance work, started my own shop. We did a lot of DARPA and IARPA research as well as private sector work. During that time, I hacked planes, I hacked trains, I hacked cars. Uh, we did work for the largest hedge funds in the world. I did work for state and local. Um, had a lot of opportunity to do a lot of things. And I, I think I've learned a lot along the way. Um, and I think I've learned things incorrectly along the way as well. So when I speak, it's kind of story time with Bruce. I'm giving you my view of the world. You're welcome to disagree with me. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, raise your hand. Um, the one thing we've learned from ShmooCon and arming people with squishy foam rubber balls to throw at us is when one person throws a ball, a bunch of people will throw balls, right? Because you always have that thing like, I can't be the only one thinking this is bullshit. And it turns out you're not, right? Like the entire room is agreeing with you, but no one's saying it. So um, if you disagree with what I'm saying today, um, please uh, throw whatever is convenient uh, at you. Uh, what? OK, all right. Um, if an anyone here fly fish? OK, call me out. I'm really a terrible fly fisherman. I'm also self-taught in that space as well. And I've been doing it for much less time. I've been doing security for 20 years and fly fishing for like four. So um, yeah? Yes. Well, there's kind of. I mean, there's the t it's more around conservation than fly fishing. But there's a lot of, there's, there's people like, your grandfather taught you how to fly fish. Um, I broke my grandfather's fly rod after he died because I didn't know how to use it. So that's a very sad story. As I tried to teach myself fly fishing, I broke my grandfather's hand-built bamboo rod, which in hindsight was really bad, and no one should have let me get away with it. So um, that's a, that was like cathartic. I never told anyone about that. Congratulations. It's like you know, therapy with Bruce time. Um, what got me thinking about doing this talk is uh, last year, I, um, I've had a lot of really ridiculous opportunities given my background. People have taken chances with me that they probably shouldn't have. Um, last year, I served as a senior technical advisor for the Presidential Commission on Cybersecurity. And I traveled around the country with a commission, interviewing public and private sector organizations, organizing all the commission events, talking with the commissioners and their staff and Congress critters and people from the White House and whatever. And I learned a ton through the process. It was fascinating. But I was traveling a lot, like between being a commercial consultant and then um, a CTO of a publicly traded company at the time and being the advisor of the Presidential Commission. I was on the road all the time. In order to stay sane, I used to bring a bike with me when I traveled. And I would like take a bike and go bike around. Because you get to see the community. You get out of the hotel. You get out of that rut of like, oh, I'm in a Hampton, but I don't know what Hampton. Like, I don't even know what time zone, right? So um, with, a, with my fly gear, 
it was an excuse to get out into the wilderness, right? It, it was because um, biking in places like Dallas, like if you're staying in a hotel in downtown Dallas and think, I'd like to go for a bike ride. It's like, I'd like to go get run over by a car. They're functionally equivalent. It's the same concept. So I'm like, they've never seen a cyclist in Dallas before. I was the first one. There was like a referendum to allow no more cyclists. They're like, nope, we can't have any more. So instead I went out and I go fly fishing and I find local bodies of water and sometimes uh, once it was um, in, in um, Dayton on Memorial Day weekend, and it turns out every body of water is filled with drunk Ohioans, and they're just tubing, and the fish do not eat when there's drunk Ohioans in the water, so that sucked. Uh, but other times I was in Minnesota, I get to go fly fishing in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and it would be great. And as I'm standing there not catching fish, I'm thinking, is there a tie between what I'm doing here and my day job doing security? And ostensibly the answer was no. Um, and so I pushed a rock uphill, and I eventually came up with this talk. So we're gonna try this out, and see, see how it works out. So fly fishing in a nutshell is actually a pitch battle. I was just describing this to someone. If you're doing like normal lake fishing and you're going after like a bass or some, something far away that you can't see, you're trolling in the ocean, you don't see the fish, right? You're just like <whistles> boom, reeling it in, waiting. Is anything there? I have no idea. With trout fishing, you'll be like, there's a trout. Your odds of catching are almost zero, right? That fish is smarter than you. It's basically like, fuck you, buddy. Like, I was fishing in, a, in a, like a legendary trout stream in Arizona. I'm standing from like here to the middle of the table away from a whole school of brown trout, all about yay big. I spent an hour. Nope, nope you don't want to nope, eat that one? OK, change it out. Nope, not that. Nope. Give him a break. Try it again. Fuck you. And I walked away. Like, I just <laughs> sat there and had this fight. It was one-sided, right? Like, I was having a battle. And they were just like hanging out. Like, hey, what's up, buddy? Um, so this is fly fishing in a nutshell, is you have a human who's doing something, standing in cold water. It's usually actually quite relaxing. Um, I had a client where they, their headquarters were on a protected trout stream. In the morning, I would get dressed for work. I would drive to client site. I'd get out of the, uh, the car. I'd put on my waders, grab my gear, walk into the stream right like in front of where I was working, fish for two hours, get out, take all my wet stuff off, throw it in the trunk of my car, go in and work. And at the end of the day, get dressed again and fish until I got hungry and go Go, it was great. Like, I was the best client ever, like, as far as I was concerned. No one else did that, by the way. Like, when you're working for a hedge fund and you come walking out, like, stripping off all your waiters, and all the people working at the hedge fund are like, who's this guy trespassing? And then I pull my badge out. They're like, that's weird. You know, <laughs> we should investigate the contractors better. So, um, what's the secret to fly fishing? Anyone can put a hook in the water. I proved it empirically with those brown trout that day. Um, there's, what's the secret to that? There's, there's an awful lot of opinions on how to catch trout, right? And, and I mean trout very specifically. Like fly fishing is kind of a, um, an asshole sport in the sense that almost exclusively we're fishing for trout. You can fish for all kinds of things. You can catch other fish. But for the most part, like trout's the thing that you're going after. This is a picture of Heidi having caught her first trout in Estes Park um, at <laughs> right in the middle of downtown Estes Park. Um, and I had nothing to do with it. Our, our, our guide that day, was, that day was great, walked her through all the mechanics of how to fish and everything. If I had done it, um, we'd probably not be talking to each other right now. So it, it worked out very well. Um, she caught her first fish. But how did she do it? So there's lots of parts to fishing. And one of the things that people focus on when they think of fly fishing is the cast, right? Like there's this process that you get thinking of. Uh, getting the line out there and it looks beautiful. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, like what's the difference between fishing with a lure and fly fishing? Well, with fly fishing, you're casting the line, right? With a lure, you're casting the lure. You got this monofilament, this heavy thing at the end, and you throw it out there and it goes out. Um, if you're fly fishing, it's actually the weight of the line that you're using to your advantage to get the fly to where you want it to be. And that's why you have this weird mechanic of, of when you're casting, uh, arms are going everywhere. And as it turns out, when you start doing this, you're just overwhelmed, right? It's for like anyone who's tried to learn how to golf, like there's a million things happening at once and the whole time the ball's just there like, yeah. You know, like every arms are going everywhere, knees are bent, back straight, bend that elbow, not the other one. And fly fish casting is the same same concept. It's very easy to wave your hand next to your head. Usually you just kind of make a knot. This was from a guy's website that teaches fly casting as part of his guide tours. This is the, the single hand rod cast I teach are outlined below. These are all the different things he teaches, which apparently is not a comprehensive list, which is a little frightening, right? There, there's casting that isn't that, like the double and Annie's pretzel knot one, you know, I don't really, I don't know. This is me. Um, and one of my sons, uh, when I got back into fly fishing, after I broke my grandfather's rod, I took a 35-year hiatus. And <laughs> my uh, um, uh, family was kind enough a few years ago. I biked cross country, and uh, they followed me and made sure I didn't die. So Heidi drove our RV and our three sons um, across the US, 
very slowly um, at 60 mile increments while I didn't die biking across the, the country. And we got to Colorado, and once you get out of the wasteland that is Kansas, I mean, no offense to anyone from Kansas, but you're just a big ramp that goes to Colorado, right? Like, <laughs> you gain 1,500 foot of elevation in a smooth plain that ends in Pueblo. You're like, hey, the Rockies! Like, fuck all that. Um, so, I, they, they have a cool space museum, and there's like a big underground salt mine and corn. You know what? This is fascinating. Industrial, industrial farming is fascinating, especially if you've like ridden through a, a, a state that does nothing but industrial farming. And you think to yourself, how does corn grow? How many ears of corn are on one corn stalk? One! One ear of corn. You think it's like the pilgrim is just like laden with corn. No, and it's all exactly at this height. If you go past an industrial corn farm, every ear of corn is right here, and there's only one, because that's what the machine is designed to do. Pop, 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 pop. Is it the most efficient way to go get corn? Nope. But it's the cheapest. That's how we grow corn. So Kansas is fascinating in the sense, like when you drive past the Chicken McNugget factory that is a Purdue slaughterhouse for chickens, you have to explain to your kids, like, how, what's in there? You're like, that's where they grow chicken nuggets. Um, <laughs> you learn a lot about industrial farming. But we get to Colorado, they're like, oh, there's trees in the wilderness, and it's very engaging. So I decided, like, we're going to start fly fishing. So we, we're in this town, um, and, and we buy a couple fly outfits. And I act like I know what I'm doing, and I'm busy like, watching YouTube videos on like, how to fly fish. And so we go to this stream. And within a few minutes, I've caught a 40-foot pine. Um, <laughs> I'm measuring it to see if it's the length, if I can keep it. Um, my son is a little skeptical of the situation, as you can, you can see. I, I've taught myself almost exclusively through, this is not, not kidding, YouTube videos, right? Watching YouTube videos, reading some books, that's how I learned how to fly cast. Um, and it's the few guides I've met with, and it, they correct the idiotic things that I'm doing and have helped me um, kind, of, uh, kind of adjust. You can be mentored by someone. It helps a lot when you're starting, right? It helps a lot to be with someone that knows what they're doing to prevent you from building up bad habits. Like any other sport, like any other um, uh, you know, profession, if you build bad habits early, you're gonna carry those bad habits for the rest of your life, right? So as I'm busy watching YouTube and focusing on like what my forearm is doing and not paying attention to my wrist, I'm building bad habits with my wrist and therefore my cast is going to hell and it takes some like 22 year old guy from Colorado to, to correct me. So uh, you can learn it off the internet, but it's not like the ideal way to learn it. What else? Yeah. Jump rope, is that good? What, one of the, uh, the styles? I don't know, like this guy, I, I think he's trolling by the middle of this, right? <laughs> Like the curving line, the, you know, bending around corners. Like, oh, come on. Like, this isn't. Jump roll sounds more like the MMA style of, you know, something. Well, so a roll cast is actually, when you think of fly casting, you think of this big movement where the fly goes really far behind you and comes back out. If you're in an environment like this where you've got a bunch of brush behind you, you can't bring your rod tip back. So a roll cast is a way to basically do it all in front of you. So you start the line coming up toward you, and then you roll it back out. So the jump roll must involve some extra like flourish in there for some god awful reason. But a roll cast keeps everything in front of you, so you're not getting tied up with the trees behind you. Um, so then there's this concept of presentation of the fly, right? So you say, no, 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 the cast is okay. It's really how you present it to the fish, right? This is another secret you got to worry about. So you have to think about fish will hide behind barriers, right? Because there are like ah, birds and shit that want to eat them, so they're like kind of. That was my hawk, by the way. I've been practicing that. Was that? That was good. Yeah. Okay. Good feedback, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> so, if you land, <laughs> it just, ah, like that's it. <laughs> oh, it's these really small talks that I like. If I did this in front of a big audience, that wouldn't have landed, but that really, that was good. Um, when you land a fly here in some slow water, you, what you really were trying to do with a fly is it get it to imitate what it would do in real life. And for the most part, any of the things that you're casting in the water are just getting taken by the water downstream, right? The, you, you think of flies as things that live on top of the water and scooting around. Very little of what you're presenting to a fish lives on top of the water. It's actually just under the surface. And you're trying to get it to move in a natural way as if the current were dragging it along. Because uh, unlike um, bass, which are pretty stupid, they'll eat anything that looks like it might be food. Trout. The minute it doesn't look natural to them, they give up. They're like, oh, that's not real. I'm not going to eat that thing. So in this case, the fly lands here, but they have all this line resting in water that's moving faster. And so that line starts to go downstream, and it drags that fly down with it at an artificially uh, uh, fast speed, right? So in order to uh, correct that, what we do is called mending the line. So you kind of take the line, and you loop the line that's closer to you up into the fast-moving water, and let it come down, and let it come down, and let it come down, while that fly 
which is on a big piece of monofilament, so it's not affected by you doing all this shit, um, will slowly work its way down the current to try to trick that fish. So that's called the presentation, right? And so the presentation is important because sometimes you'll be on a, on a, um, you know, on a curve. Sometimes you're going downstream. Sometimes you're going upstream. A lot of this is because you're in a freaking river, right? And there's like rocks and trees, and you can't necessarily control the best place to cast. Like the best place for you to cast might be filled with a giant down oak tree, and you can't stand there. So you got to be downstream or upstream. So understanding how to present the fly effectively to the fish that you're trying to catch is very important. Okay. Some other people say, no, it's actually the fly itself, right? The fly is the most important thing. There's all kinds of different flies. What we did today, um, about four or five people in this room came and tied flies. Got, she's got her fly. So we tied some flies today. And what we tied were called attractors. These are flies that aren't designed to look like anything. They're just designed to be kind of exciting. You know, they're like the club scene of flies. There's oons, 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 and the bass and the panfish and the kind of more predatory things that will just basically eat anything. Are like, yeah, that's cool. But trout and other fish that are um, can be more selective and typically live in shallower water are going to go. They they need something that looks more like what they're trying to eat. What happens in a fly's life cycle, most aquatic flies, when we going for trout, we're going for, uh, to basically imitate three, three things, a caddis fly, a mayfly, or a stone fly. The vast majority of things that trout eat are those three, uh, three different types of flies. And those three flies go through the same three stages of life. There's a nymph stage, which is like a larval stage, living under a rock, just kind of chilling down low in the water. Um, sometimes they break loose, and they tumble through the water until they land on another rock. So what you're doing with these nymphs is just kind of imitating this little thing that's broken loose from a rock and is tumbling around. An emerger is that after it's transformed from its larval stage into an insect, it, it comes up off the bottom and it'll slowly rise to the surface of the water, sit just below the surface of the water, and it's trying, it's got like a wing sac on its back and it's trying to get its wings out of its wing sac, break the surface tension and eventually fly away, right? And so um, this is just fresh meat for a trout because it's a totally defenseless, big juicy bug. It's got all the nutrients of a fly that's already made it, but it can't fly yet. So when these things are, are, are um, you know, in the water, they'll eat them. And a dry fly is what you would think of as like the fly that sits on top of the water. We're thinking of like conventional uh, kind, of, uh, kind of fly fishing. And so tying the flies, getting the flies to imitate flies, is, it's, a, it's a lifetime skill. Um, actually, this weekend on Sunday, I'm going up to the Fly Tying Symposium in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, anyone else planning on going? Um, even my family, I think, has decided, actually, no, we're not going to go. <laughs> like, this doesn't sound like an hour-long seminar watching someone tie a fly and then go to another hour-long seminar watch somebody else tie a fly. Go fuck yourself. So um, <laughs> this is actually, even if you're not a fly fisher person, you're not into this, uh, The History of Fly Fishing in 50 Flies is a very interesting book that goes through from back in, in Western Europe when people started the sport, um, and it kind of advancing through materials, through the different types of fish that they were catching, the different technologies they had. Um, if you want to learn about fly fishing, it's actually, I think it's fascinating, and not just because I'm into the sport. It's actually um, a kind of a neat deconstruction of the sport based around the flies. It does have lots of pictures. There's a hand-drawn, lots of hand-drawn pictures. It's, it's really, I, I love, that, love that book. Um, OK, so then you're like, no, 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 flies, whatever. You can buy the flies, present them correctly, you don't have to be perfect. And I attest, like, you do not have to have a perfect looking fly. They can be pretty raggedy if you present them correctly. Maybe it's not it. But you're in the wilderness, you, there's gear, right? So here's me and my sons having just purchased this fly rod. You all already know there's like line everywhere. Like, we have no idea what we're doing with any of this kit. When you go fly fishing and you're off in the woods somewhere, there's a non trivial amount of crap that you need to go fly fishing, right? You clearly need the rod and the reel, but then you need waders, right? Because I'm going to stand in the water. And if the water is below like 50 degrees or 60, even 60 degrees, you're going to be freezing your ass off if you're in there in a pair of sandals and shorts, right? So you need waders to stay dry. Um, it's slippery, and you need to be able to stand on these rocks. So like the Birkenstocks, wherever you were wearing as a hippie, they weren't working out. So you need these big boots, and sometimes they have like tungsten cleats in the bottom to help you hold onto the rocks and that kind of thing. And then you need a net. On the off chance that you catch something, you need a net, right? <laughs> like I, I have a nice gently use net if anybody wants it. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it sits on my back, um, and every once in a while um, I put it in my car and then put it back on my back, and that's about all it is. Um, these can get really expensive. Like, all this stuff can get exotically expensive. Uh, I've seen nets that are like $700 nets, right? Because these are all like handmade, 
hand bent, exotic woods and whatever, clearly designed for the fisherman who doesn't catch shit, right? Like if, you're, if your net is like a piece of art to you, it's because you're not using it as far as I'm concerned. So I have a $700 net. Um, I really, I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> so we're clear. That was just for the theatrics of the situation. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I actually, I could tell. She, is he kidding? Like, I'm not really. I think, I'm just to mm. I think we're good. Yeah, the one you know, yeah. I have a storage unit full of other stuff. Um, you, need, you need a vest um, because, again, you're carrying all this crap. You got a whole bunch of different. You know, because you have no idea what the fish are going to eat, so you brought every fly you own because you have no idea what's about to happen, and you'll be damned if you're going to miss out. So you have like all kinds of fi uh, flies tucked in there. Um, you've got nippers. These are basically really expensive fingernail clippers. Like you can spend these are like forty dollar nippers. You can spend like three hundred dollars on nippers. It's just a piece of machine, freaking titanium or something. So I don't know. They just bespoke nippers just for you. I don't know. Um, they have a little thing to kind of like ream out the hole in the in the hook because a lot of times you get glue and crap in there. Uh, you get tippet, and this is extra line, so if you need to tie more leader on, and of course you're tying, you, you maybe have a couple rods, a couple reels, they all have different weight lines, so you carry a lot of different weights of tippet. You gotta carry a bunch of freaking forceps. Again, on the off chance you catch a damn fish and then it swallows the hook, you gotta get the hook out from like way inside its anus apparently, because they will swallow it like all the way through their body, right? <laughs> like when they take it, you're like, oh, it's, it's in another fish. Like, oh my God, like, <laughs> I don't understand. Um, you have high float, um, something that will make the dry fly actually float. If you tied it correctly, it floats on its own. I don't tie it correctly, so you have to give it a little Viagra to get it to sit on top of the water. Um, then you have the um, uh, boxes to keep all your flies in, small, large, waterproof, floaty. Floaty, everything should float, right? Because you're going to drop this at least once, right? And be chasing after it, running downstream, scaring the hell out of every fish around you, right? That's also a predicate that you've scared everything around you so they don't come. Got another bag because your vest doesn't hold all the shit that you needed in the first place. And then you got to have the hat so you're not a poser, OK? So like, this is the gear. Like, that's the baseline. We're like, what do I need to go fly fishing? It's like, I don't know, a grand worth of crap just to get started to go stand in the water and not catch anything. So if you want to not catch fish, just give me $1,000. We'll call it even, right? Like, you don't, have to, you don't have to do anything else. All right, so that's the gear. People say the gear is important. The gear is important. Um, but like any you know, race car is only as good as its pilot, you still need the humans involved. So then the next thing the human has to do is read the water, right? So this is out of Estes Park uh, when Heidi and I were up there fishing. Uh, the fish are not uniformly distributed. It's not like raisin bread, right? Like the water doesn't just have like a reasonable amount of fish everywhere. The fish are all concentrated in the coastlines. They're all the liberal fish. And then the more right-wing fish are kind of in the center of the water. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> wow, I like that one. That was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> got it, got it, oh yeah. Um, so if we look at this section of water, like the first thing that you do when you get to a body of water is, is first you gotta assess like what am I dealing with? Like is this even a reasonable spot to fish? And so, yeah, we like on this side there's a road, so this is actually all had been flooded out um, what, four years ago in the big Colorado floods and the, they had reconstructed all this but they've redone a lot of the banks with these huge boulders to prevent erosion because there's a road up here and they didn't want to have to deal with it again. So these, we made to climb down through all this crap. On this side is just all brush, right? So it's really a pain in the ass to cast because you have to like, you have to be doing the roll cast and everything else. So we actually spent most of our time fishing over on this side. Um, you got, this is fast water that was coming down off of a fall. You got a pool over here, open water. Fish don't like open water, it's warm. Trout don't like warm water. They want it cold. I mean, they want pretty damn chilly. In Maryland, as an example, um, everywhere except for Garrett County, which is all the way in Western Maryland, they, st I mean, they stock trout all over the state. And every river, except for the rivers in Garrett County, all the trout by July, or even usually June, are dead. They expect 100% fish mortality for the trout that they stock in Maryland that aren't in Garrett County, because the water gets too hot. 70 degree water, trout are dead. They don't live. So they, Maryland's stocking trout in streams that is not natural for them to be in, just for fishermen to catch them. Uh, so I, I mean, I still fish the Patasco and some of the other local rivers, but it doesn't really feel right. Like, I'm like, yeah, these fish don't even want to be here, and they're going to die if a freaking hawk does, ah, doesn't get them at some point. <laughs> so, so the warmth, like, you know, on a cold day, they'll, they'll, they like the, warm, the, the sun. On a, on, a, on a warm day, they'll stay away from it. Plus, they're, they're out in the middle, get caught by predators. So in general, they're not going to be in shallow water right in the middle of an open space. Um, and then this all starts again. The falls are something to, to consider because 
what will happen is the falls where the, where the water is coming down makes this very turbulent motion, and you get a lot of food churned up. So any kind of nymph or anything that was attached to a rock in that area has a relatively short lifespan because they'll get turned over. So at the tail end of the falls, this thing starts to fall uh, uh, out of the water and, and go to the bottom. You'll often find trout that are eating in there. So you got to get to a place, read the water. Okay. What else? This is a big one. Matching the hatch. So once you get an idea of the read of the area, you'll actually walk into the water, you'll pick up a rock, and you'll look at it. And what you're looking for are the insects that are living on the bottom of the rock, all the larval states of all these different types of flies and things that are native to that area. How big are they? How mature are they? Are they hatching right now? What colors are they? And you try to find a, a fly, the pattern that you have, that matches something that you find on that rock. If you go in and at 9 o'clock in the morning start throwing in some kind of caddis fly emerger, right, this thing that's hatched and is coming up to the surface, trout's probably not going to eat it because the, they those will emerge in later afternoon, like 2, 3, 4 o'clock as the water gets warmer and there's more sunlight. So if I take a, 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 a caddis fly emerger and cast it in the water at 9 a.m., I probably won't catch anything. I come to the same spot at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be hauling out trout as fast as I can hook them, right? And so in the morning, I'm going to be looking for more you know, uh, things that will more apt to be in the water, the nymphs, the scuds, the worms, things like that, that the fish won't find unnatural for that, that kind of day. So the idea of matching the hatch is like super important. And then there's like blind ass luck. So um, sometimes you're at the right place at the right time. This is me drinking champagne while fishing, as one would do with a big asshole sport like this. Um, not catching any fish in Estes Park. Um, I'm, it was uh, a snowy March day or April day in Estes Park, and I didn't catch a thing. So Noise and Heidi handed me champagne, and I'm still to this day a little confused as to why, but it was nice. It was good. Okay, so then the big question, right? As this guy walks out of the room, he says, what the hell does this have to do with security? He's like, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> it's like a straight man there nailed it for me. That was good. That was perfect. So what does this have to do with security? Well, on the face of it, fishing is complicated. I just went through, like, there's a whole shitload of stuff um, that has to happen in order to catch a fish. It's an industry filled with hobbyists and pros, uh, filled with people who are self-taught. If you're mentored early on, it stops you from making mistakes. Um, your gear matters, but we still matter more. Um, it's dangerous if you're not paying attention. Um, it's predominantly white and male. Like, that's the reality of fly fishing. Like, it's a white male sport, um, and it's a lot of fun. As it turns out, that's the same thing. Information security has the same traits as fly fishing, right? Um, all these things still hold true. So let's kind of kind of walk through that. Um, information security is complicated, right? Like no shit, right? This is this is a big no done 2017. The thing on the left, right, is the uh, the nice framework. So uh, NIST has put together the nice framework. In the last few years, they've given it a little more structure. Uh, and made it a little more reachable. I mean, there's a whole document now around the, the framework and how they've broken down. And effectively, it's the big book of every cybersecurity-related job ever at any point in the history of mankind. And it's a big tree, because NIST will make things that look like trees, because they want the hierarchy and the structure. At the top level of the tree, all jobs that we would do in this industry fall into one of these buckets. And then they split, and they split, and they split, until there's hundreds of different jobs with hundreds of different uh, levels of, of uh, skill associated with it, then this defined as every cybersecurity job ever in the history of mankind, right? If you go back 20 years ago, there weren't that many types of jobs, right? Like you had some network security admins, you had somebody that did risk management, we didn't really understand cyber risk all that well, you had some penetration testing type people, maybe for lucky, a couple people around investigations, but we didn't really get broken into all that much unless you were the government, like you, most people didn't know that they were hacked. Pre Google Aurora, most organizations didn't believe that they were the victims of being hacked, right? Google Aurora was like the big watershed event, like, hey, we got owned. And other people were like, oh, shit, we got owned too. Um, and we've now been living in this age of breaches because people have better eyes um, on the system and they're doing a better job of analyzing the data in front of them. So, you know, when you think about, again, the number of books that I showed earlier, about 4,000 books on fly fishing. Computer security is 24,000 books. That's just an arbitrary metric and an arbitrary search term. But it got that actually got more than cybersecurity, which I thought was good, right? Computer security got 24,000. Cybersecurity only got like 12,000. It was like, haha, it hasn't totally taken us all over yet. Just close. Um, so while we're talking about that, let's go over the cyberscape. 
from, um, from Momentum. So Momentum like is a, a track investments and uh, M&A material in our industry, in the, in the cybersecurity industry. And they've break, broken apart the, uh, the landscape of everything that has to do with cybersecurity into a bunch of buckets and then categorize every company that they can find that's active in this space into those buckets, right? So when we talk about the complexity of the industry, we have things like, um, uh, excuse me, we have, let's see, network security, we have endpoint security, uh, we have application security, there's messaging security, uh, web security, uh, managed security. This is actually, at some point, my logo, company's logo will be in there. Uh, we have uh, risk and compliance, uh, industrial, uh, fraud, security operations, incident response, transaction security, specialized threat analysis, threat intelligence, data security, identity access management cloud, and mobile security, right? That's, uh, that's it, right? <laughs> and the, every little dot here is like a pixel because this is so small. Like they've had to jam all these companies' logos because there's so many companies and wedge them all together to fit on one freaking page. It's mind boggling. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's their whole shtick, um, is, is secure messaging on mobile platforms. Um, so as much as they have a desktop thing, it's very much like designed around mobility of communications and communicating the way that you want it and whatever. I Look, man. So it, I actually talked with um, the Wicker CEO the other day and got like his pitch about what are you trying to do? And it wasn't what I expected. Like it, I was thinking it was more like secure messaging kind of thing. But when you put a point on what they are trying to do, it's land in this space. I don't, and, and, to, and he, he will freely admit they're not doing a good job of communicating that message because people have that reaction, right? They have that reaction like, oh, you're a messaging company. Like, no, 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 stop. It's the same way like, um, you know, uh, Tenable is that Nessus company, right? And they're like, well, we do more than that. Well, that's cool. You're the, you're, you're the, the, the Nessus company, right? You're like, oh, drives them nuts. Like, because people will call them, like, I had to call Nessus and get some support. I'm like, you had to call Tenable to get support. <laughs> like, ah, oh, fuck it. Um, so, I mean, there are companies that struggle with their identity in this space, but they, they I mean, in their universe, they think they're mobile. Uh, hobbyists and pros, right? So, you can get degrees. This is a new thing, right? The ability to get a cybersecurity degree. If you're over the age of 32, you do not have an undergraduate degree in cybersecurity. You may have a master's degree, some graduate degree in cybersecurity, but as of what we require now, 14 years ago, there were really not general access to programs at the undergraduate level that would constitute a cybersecurity, information security, computer security degree, right? We started having, what? What? Oh, what, it was, this was a di slide from a different talk and I gutted it and now I'm getting shit for it. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> man, I, yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah. <laughs> it was actually, it was, uh, I was fishing while I stepped in a bear trap is what it turned out. So um, the, um, this is a relatively new thing at the undergrad degree, but it's ramping up really fast, right? And it's amazing the diversity that's happening at the collegiate level. So I do a lot of college recruiting uh, at different universities, and I, I use RIT and Penn State, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology in New York, and Penn State, um, obviously, in, in State College. And I recruit from both of those organizations very aggressively. They could not be any different, uh, more different when it comes to what they're teaching their kids from a security space. RIT is a technical institute. It's very applied. I mean, it's a good school, right? It's a four-year school. They have all the resources you can imagine. Like, I mean, the, the amount of computing power they have, the access to the industry that they have, you get people who are very applied, very up to speed on, on state of the art and what's possible, but they don't necessarily have the grounding and kind of core research methods that don't have the broader humanities background that you would get somewhere else. You go to Penn State, you get a lot of big thinking, right? I have people that understand the foundations, the practice, they understand um, you know, a lot of the policy issues. I could get a, an analyst out of Penn, uh, out of Penn State any, uh, any day of the week. I can get a consultant out of Penn State. If I need somebody to actually go do something to a system, that's not Penn State, right? I have one person I've ever hired from Penn State that I would consider kind of in that doer category. It was a comp sci major who coincidentally kind of likes security, so I pulled them through the security knot hole, right? But everybody else, I've, they've, I've, I've hired them to be policy people and do like CETA work and that kind of thing. So, um, and I'm not slagging on Penn State. I mean, that's clearly that both those kinds of uh, um, 
disciplines are important in an industry. But when you think of like, hey, I want to go get a degree in cybersecurity, I'm looking at Penn State and RIT, that's like, hey, I'm thinking of something that will get me from point A to point B, so I'm looking at a Lamborghini and a leftover space shuttle, right? Like they're, wow, those are two radically different things. Like you need very different skills to operate both of them, but they will get you from point A to point B. Like congratulations in, in divining that. So, um, and then you get local schools like, um, uh, I advise Penn College of Technology up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. It's a two-year school that's now a four-year school, very much vocational. Their cybersecurity program is in the same college as the, the, their welding degree, right? You can get a four-year degree in welding, and the dean of that college has a master's in welding, right? And he oversees the cybersecurity program. Thankfully, he freely admits, like, I don't know a goddamn thing about this, right? Like, that's my <laughs> assistant dean knows cyber, and he's putting together the program and the curriculum. But they're really like you know, what do we do? And so they've gotten industry people and academic uh, folks together to try to help them build a degree that's targeted for, uh, for the kids that are there. So, and, and the same thing's even happening here in, in Delaware as you're putting together the program here. So there's not, unlike mechanical engineering, uh, like psychi psychology, things like that, there's no agreed upon what the disciplines here look like. Um, we, can, we can hem and haw about certs and the efficacy of them in our industry all we like. Um, my, my struggle with, for those of us that don't have these, that existed at a time where it wasn't even possible to get those, what is the other metric in which to gauge competency if it's not a cert, right? The other metric is smart person interviews, right? Someone smarter than me interviewing me to see if I know what I'm talking about in my domain. And for a lot of organizations, that's hard. They don't have people smarter. That's why they're requiring the CEH and the CISP and whatever, because they're just gonna rely upon that as like a surrogate for a smart person doing the interview. So, um, I mean, I struggle a lot with this because of the mandatory nature of them, the fact that it's a printing press of money for the organizations that run these systems, and you know, that's a, that's a bigger issue, but um, I, I, I've come to, the, come to grips a little bit that this is a necessary evil, and again, you can't age discriminate, but part of it, until we have two or three generations of programs of the undergrad, we're not gonna be able to kind of start to push these aside. Because this is, for people like me, if you need, I, I don't have any certs, right? I've taught cert programs for certs that I didn't have, which is weird, like I don't know how I was able to do that, but um, I've never had a single cert in my life. Obstensively, most contracts that I worked on under the federal government, um, I didn't qualify for most of the labor categories. I had special labor categories constructed for me because I'm a college dropout with 20 years experience and no certs. And they're like, well, that doesn't fit anywhere. Like, we'll just write Bruce's labor category. Um, and <laughs> there, there would be, there were several contracts with different government agencies. I was the only person in a labor category because they were wired so I could get in the door. Um, and then we go to conferences and we learn from our peers. And that's for, again, people that ex were in this space before the degrees, that was how you learn, right? Like, you go to events like this and you'd listen to people and you'd talk and you'd network and you get to know who's doing what and what else is interesting. And it's and, and still the case, right? I mean, we, DEF CON's huge. Now we have all these B-sides events, we have all these other things. We can go to places and talk to people that are like-minded and get interesting. Same thing in fly fishing, right? Like there are people that, I mean, they probably have a degree in wildlife conservation, environmental, whatever, but their focus was on uh, uh, freshwater uh, uh, aquatic wildlife, right? They're focused on fish. They, they know everything about the, the streams in central New York, right? There are agriculture universities in New York State that you can go to and learn all about New York agriculture and wildlife and become an expert in that space in a way that I can't even envision. Um, I grew up as a, a fourth generation lumberman. My, my uh, father, his father, and his father all were lumbermen. My brothers worked for them. They still all are lumbermen. Uh, I got out of that business. That was not my thing. But I have an appreciation for my brother's degrees in forestry. Like the fact that I do like some casual woodworking and I cut down trees in my backyard with a chainsaw does not make me a forester. It just means I'm kind of reasonably confident with a chainsaw. And if the zombies show up, like I'll probably not die in the first wave. But um, you know, th there's a real discipline around wildlife management, right? And and part of what we do as fishermen is is a respect for the outdoors and and whatever. So these are pros in this space. You can get certified as you know, professional cast instructors, you can get certified as professional guides. Um, there's all these different bodies that will certify people and say, hey, trout fisher person who's giving guided tours, you probably know what you're talking about, which is about the level of thumbs upness that some of these certs give us in the cybersecurity space. And as I said earlier, I'm going to International Fly Time Symposium on Sunday. <laughs> I'm super excited about it. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm excited to be at B-Sides Delaware. 
I think I'm actually more excited to go talk to guys about fly tying, um, just so you all know where, where I stand. Um, anyway, Dory, yeah. Um, if filled with uh, people who are self-taught. I love this photo. Like, that's, it's not a self-portrait, but it could have been. Like, <laughs> is this how I do it? Like, I'm not really sure. Hacker one, I, I'm, I'm a, a mixed mind of the bug bounty uh, trends that we see these days, and I, I, I think they're, they're um, an effective component of a cybersecurity risk management program, a broad program. They're a poor component if you're betting the farm on it, right? Like, I don't think we need to pay for a pen test. Let's just have a bug bounty. Like, <laughs> no, like that's a horrifyingly bad idea. And there are organizations that have kind of gone down that road. You're like, no, 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 that's not all right. But this idea that there are a whole group of people that are getting into application security because of bug bounties is actually kind of fascinating because it's 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 like um, was it Fiverr or whatever you just task people like you can just go pick up a website and be like what are the rules of engagement okay I'm gonna go attack it and see what I can find that's actually kind of neat right it's it's just mercenary um, uh, pen testing there are parts of it that still kind of make me a little nervous but all in all if we're if we're building more people. Um, and getting more people in this industry in kind of non-conventional ways, I'm okay with that as long as the companies that are participating um, understand how the quality of some of the work they're gonna get out of here. I've worked with companies that have gone down the bug bounty route, and there's definitely this like, hey, we got a bunch of interesting stuff, and we got nothing that's interesting, right? Like, although the volume was constant, like they got a constant volume of stuff, but there would only be one or two things out of 100 that were useful after the first month or so. Um, and, and there are other instances where it hasn't been the case, but the vast majority that I've seen, they get a big oomph at the beginning, people get their money, and then that's about the end of the useful stuff. Mentoring early on helps imme immensely. For those of you that have been in the field a while, you've been asked these questions. For those of you, if this is new to you, you are probably asking yourself these kind of questions right now. Like, I, I'm amazed the number of times that I'll give a talk at a place and someone will come up to me and be like, hey, I'm not, doing this kind of thing, but I'm thinking about it. How do I get started? Um, I gave a talk at the uh, Association of the US Army in, um, in DC a couple years ago. And during the, before the talk, I was having lunch um, in the cafeteria at the convention center down in DC. And this guy, you know, I'm just sitting there by myself. This guy comes down and sits down next to me. And uh, we get to talking and I'm like, uh, he's like, you know, what do you do? And I'm telling him and I'm like asking what he does. So this guy graduated from West Point, okay, cool. He's a ranger. All right, that's pretty badass. And he's got his MBA. Wow. Man, you know how to kill people and make them feel dumb. Like, I'm like, that's really, he's, and he's a nice guy, but he's clearly like off the charts smart. Like, talk to him for like 10 or 15 minutes. I'm like, so much respect for this cat, right? Like, the fact that he's put his life in the line, he's been deployed, and now he thinks the greatest service he can do to his country is work procurement at the Pentagon. I'm like, ah, oh, God, that hurts me so much. Um, and so then I'm telling him about what I do. He's like, man, Cybersecurity is so fascinating, but I just can't figure out how to get started in it. I'm like, you're West Point Ranger MBA, and the thing that's challenging to you is how to get started in cyber? Like, holy, we are doing this so wrong, right? Like, god damn, man. So I actually like, called him in the middle of the talk that I was giving. I like, had him stand up, like, let's talk about this guy. I'm like, oh, that's probably dangerous, but it worked out. He didn't. <laughs> um, you know, can I hack back with someone hacks me? So, so I mean, People ask that question maybe not in that way, but um, I, I'm reminded back 15 years ago, we were doing community wireless networking stuff in Northern Virginia, trying to build a big nest network of companies and, and individuals sharing Wi-Fi connections so you could just move around Northern Virginia and get free internet bait, you know, off of everyone's home Wi-Fi or whatever. It's a grand utopian socialist, like, woo, socialism. And um, Bernie was in the back room guiding us all. <laughs> um, so, so one guy comes to me at one of our meetings and was like, hey, I got an idea. I got a business plan. I think it's going to work. I said, what's that? He's going to, I'm going to drive around the area and look for like open access points. And when I find them, I'm going to find the business associated. I'm going to go in and say, hey, I see that your wireless network might be vulnerable. If you give me like, I don't know, $5,000, I can fix it for you. I'm like, just so we're clear, your business plan will be viewed as extortion by other people. He's like, no, I'm just trying to help. I'm like, dude, they have no idea. When you come in, be like, I know something you don't know that's bad for your business and if you give me five thousand dollars I'll tell you about it it's like uh, I'm gonna call the cops I'll be right back you know I'm like oh my god so I'm all hooked up on the microphone now there we go can you still hear me okay good Woo! dodged a bullet um, 
is it okay to attack a website I learned? Like, again, people don't ask that necessarily. They'll be like, so I was running this free web scanner against Amazon last night. And like, oh, like <laughs> let's talk, there's like eight things we need to cover like right now. First of all, were you going through Tor? Can anyone find you? Like, <laughs> um, you know, people learn from people that have been around because we've all made mistakes, right? Like I've made so many mistakes in this space um, and I'm more than happy to help people to, to learn from those mistakes. Um, and it's the same thing, like, I swear, when I'm learning, like, fly fishing, I, I, the number of times I did this, and it was just like, I don't know what to do, because I have two problems. One, three, I want to keep fishing, and I can't right now, because I have, like, this basketball-sized pile of shit in front of me that does not gracefully go out like we saw Robert Redford earlier in the movie, right? Or in the, in the movie. I'm a movie. I'm not a talk. I'm a fucking movie. <laughs> That's my ego right there. Like, I just, <laughs> I just stepped right in it. So... Secondarily, this line's really expensive, right? And you're like, shit, I just torched a bunch of it, right? So, because I'm not going to untie that n nonsense. And then third, the, the nail knot that you have to use to connect this to the monofilament is complicated. And every time I do it, I have to Google it. Like, I have this special tool that I use, but the tool doesn't describe how to use it. It's just this weird you thing. So I'm in the middle of the water, balancing my phone. I got two lines, like, trying not to drop the phone. The fish are all like, God, that guy's terrible. Like, he's really just <laughs> the worst. Um, so... But then, like, I'll talk to someone, like, why does this keep happening? And it'll be, like, some real subtle thing, like, your hand's here instead of here. I'm like, oh, and now I don't make giant basketball sides knots of crap anymore. Like, that's great. I wish someone told me that before. Um, your gears matter, but humans matter more. This was awesome, um, this, this talk at Besides Vancouver. It's um, AI is now on its third um, uh, resurgence, not resurgence, third uh, uh, birth, if you will, in the, in the 60s and 70s. Symbolic computing will save us all, right? We don't need faster computers, we just need more abstract programming languages. We need Lisp and shit like that to make our life better. And if we can co teach computers to think symbolically, we will win. And that did not work out. And then in the mid-90s, we thought, wow, we have a lot of computing power. We'll build expert systems, and they will be like AI, and that will all work. And that shit didn't work out. And now we're like, I have the cloud! And we have so much horsepower in the cloud that we can just solve problems by running at them as fast as we can. Like, if you just run against a wall, eventually the wall will, like, move, right? Like, that's what the AI model is today. Just push really hard for a long time, and eventually the, the system will learn. It's such bullshit. But, and it's funny how much of this stuff just still turns out to be stats, right? Like, finding the standard deviation isn't machine learning. It's math! Like, it's not that complicated. <laughs> But we keep finding it out. I worked with a company that was trying to do automated discovery of denial of service through an AI system. And I spent months explaining to them how the internet worked, right? Literally, like, here's autonomous systems. Here's BGP. Here's how route flapping happens. All this kind of stuff. And they're trying to find all, like, build the AI system. They had a magic AI box that they thought eventually could find denial of service attacks. And one day I'm like, you know, you can just look at the amount of traffic, and if it's bigger than the pipe, it's a denial of service attack. There's nothing more. They're like, well, yeah, we could. I'm like, oh, fuck that. So um, humans still matter and will continue to matter in this space for a long period of time. It's the same thing here. Like, if you and I were to go fly fishing right now, I am still a shitty fly fisherman. Like, I will admit it. I'm not very good. And the difference, the amount of fish that I will catch between a $50 rod and an $850 rod are probably zero, right? Not a statistically important amount of fish will I catch, uh, uh, will be the difference between if I use those two rods. Mentally, I think I will be a better fisherman if I buy that rod. But I know in my heart of hearts, I suck, and this one will be just fine, right? Um, it hasn't stopped me from landing somewhere in the middle. So um, closer to the, no, never mind. Um, Information security is dangerous if you're not paying attention. Fishing can be very dangerous if you're not paying attention. Uh, I don't know what this thing is. <laughs> it is real. It's somewhere in South America, um, and apparently you can catch them before they catch you. It's like, po it's like lethal Pokemon. Um, <laughs> so there are things that we can do in this space that cause harm, right? We can hack back, like that causes harm. We can, and this is an interesting one. Like I, I've worked with clients who do in situ analysis, they let the attackers stay in place so they can observe them. Okay, like I have this thing that makes fire and I'm gonna put it in the middle of this pile of tissue paper. Let's hope it doesn't catch all the tissue paper on fire, right? Like it's, this is incredibly dangerous and or most organizations aren't geared up to do this. It sounds good. Most of the time, you, most organizations are better off like, boink, yanking them out, restoring normal operations and getting on with their life. 
I've been involved in breach response where they want to spend a lot of time figuring out who is breaking in. And after two or three months of the same people breaking in all the time, like, we can stop with the forensics analysis. It's the same people. Like, we don't, attribution is not important. Stop getting broken into. That's the important bit. Um, detonating malware, like, we've seen that go bad, right? Like, hey, I do malware analysis at home, and now my home blew up, right? Like, that was, oops. Um, IoT is hard. Um, even speaking out about uh, high-profile attacks will get people in trouble, right? They're, when you piss off organized crime groups and stuff, like, they won't come find you, as it turns out, right? Like, when you ask Brian Krebs, right? How many times has he been swatted? A lot. Why? Because he's called people out, right? People out that don't want to be called out. Um, and then inadvertent hacking, like, oops, um, I inadvertently hacked, um, never mind. Um, I, this is, I don't know how you get a fly through a pair of glasses, but that's somewhat terrifying. This has happened to me a lot. This is the situational awareness, like I'm doing something and not paying attention. Also, like there's a huge pool in front of me, I just like, whoop, it's like a cartoon, right? Like they'll look at the terror of my face and then the waders fill up and I'm like floating downstream. <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a water sail, a big fat water sail. Um, very quick story about a river otter. I was fishing on a protected trout stream in Wisconsin and I, I had a hike, it was like, you had to hike a mile through a cornfield. So I go in this cornfield, I go down the freaking like huge, steep, slippery and back, I get all the way to the bottom. I'm so excited because like this is supposed to be the greatest trout stream in Wisconsin, the Kinnikinnik River. And I, I was fishing on the K. I was all excited. I get all my gear on and I see a river otter like upstream, like 30 yards. Oh, cool. I haven't seen an otter in a while. I get in the water. I'm fishing. And then the, there's a river otter downstream, like 10 yards, making noises at me. I'm like, that's weird. And then the river otter's over here making noises, then running through the bush and then behind me. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and after like half an hour, I'm like, there is not a trout within 100 yards of this place. Because this otter is scared them all off, right? Because no trout wants to be near this goddamn otter. So I'm like, screw this noise. So I go walking back to my gear, which is up on the bank. And the otter swims in front of me and disappears. And I realize I put my stuff on top of its den. And I'm like, oh, man, that otter is pissed. So I go climbing up. And I'm taking my stuff off. And it's, I mean, it's an ordeal, right? Like, I got to take off the vest. I got to take off the boots. I got to tape off some waders. And I'm sitting there. I got waders around my ankle. I'm like, kind of weasel it up. The otter jumps up, like for me, your sneakers away, jumps up on the, the bank, stands up on, all, on its hind legs, ah, just making this god awful noise at me. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm literally saying, what? With my arms outstretched. And he's like, ah. And he starts like itching toward me. And I'm like, I grab my tube that I keep the, uh, the rod in. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have to beat a river otter to death, <laughs> right? Like, I thought I was coming out here to commune with nature. And instead of being like, you fucking asshole. Um, and he decided at that point that I was not going to, he, he just took off. I can't, yeah, you, you, I don't think he's that smart. I think a large abstract thing is making me angry. I think that's all he was really thinking. But um, anyway, I did not kill a river otter that day. So not that day, that day. It's, my, my, my lawyer advised me very specific language around when to declare I have not killed her. Actually, that was the Carter Page answer. Um, I, didn't, I know nothing about the dead moose either. Like, I have no idea. So, um, so information security is predominantly white and male. Uh, totally not OK, right? This is not something that's good for our industry. It's not good for society. Um, this is a complex to topic, um, both why we are that way as an industry and also the impact that it has on us, right? The fact that we don't have the diversity that we should makes us weak. Um, we are not accomplishing everything that we could be doing. We're not giving back to the community the way we could be doing. So in, in both these instances, there are organizations who are trying to make it better. Um, that's not to say you can't do things on your own to address some of these root causes, but I think that there's good work that's been going on. Um, AAS and uh, Project Healing, um, oh, excuse me, uh, Project Healing and Trouts Unlimited have youth outreach programs and outreach programs to disabled vets that I think have been very useful to make trout fishing um, and fly fishing more inclusive um, and part of the community. AAS is an organization in the DC area that does STEM outreach in schools. Year Up, I want to call special attention to Year Up. Um, Year Up is an organization that the way that they're structured is they'll take um, uh, people, adults from 18 to 25 ish, who have kind of the desire um, and, and uh, um, education background to be able to go to college, but they don't have the academic ability, or excuse me, the uh, economic ability, and not just from a financial perspective from themselves, but the fact that they may be holding down a job because they're having to take care of their grandmother or their brothers and sisters or whatever it is. You know, you've got people uh, living in areas where one or two jobs supports a family of five or six, and so people at 18 and 19 aren't able to go out in the community and, and get a job, or they have to go out in the community and get a job, and they can't. Uh, get an education. So what Year Up does is for those people, they say, okay, you're going to come and get six months of intensive training, eight to five every day. 
and it's around business management, IT, or cybersecurity. And uh, it's, it's eight to five, they show up in, in, in business attire every day, like not whatever, like I have a collared shirt, like the guys are all in suits, the women are in, in, in either, you know, they're dressed in business attire as well. This is a more complicated subject for women, like what constitutes business attire, and we can have that whole discussion. Um, but they, they then go through everything from the, the technology and the, 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 the tech aspect of their job, but also how to interact with your coworkers, how to write reports, um, you know, what a business meeting is actually like, how to communicate effectively, all these kind of things. And then, it, it's really cool. And, and so then, then when they're done, they have industry partners that they'll reach out to and you basically get a six month intern. And so these people go out in the field and they'll get uh, jobs interning for six months in their, in their uh, domain. And they, they're very sensitive to like, hey, we're trying to find companies that are close to you or within your means to get to, because some of these people don't have cars, they have to ride mass transit, so they're trying to find um, you know, ways to, to be able to make sure that they're successful in that domain. That whole time they get paid. Right? So when they get in this program, they're getting a paycheck. They get a stipend. So if they were working somewhere, if they were working at McDonald's or working at the dry cleaner, whatever it was they're doing, they can get paid to get educated. And then at the end of this process, they have the education and they have the exposure with the company they're interning with. Then they can go get a job. A lot of the companies that they intern with pick them up. Um, and a lot of, um, but even if they don't, the, the rate at which these, uh, these students have jobs after six months is something outrageous, like 93% have jobs where they're making $40,000 or more which for some of these kids who are making like $16,000 a year, I mean, it's life changing for their families, right? It's not even life changing for themselves. I mean, it's the whole damn family gets a benefit out of this. So um, the way that this works is the companies that, that um, bring the students in, they pay about $26,000, which is about what you're gonna pay a six month intern anyway. But they pay that fee to year up who uses it to fund their entire program in combination with other fundraising that they do. So if you're a hiring manager, if you're a company that is hiring today, looking for interns, looking for junior staff, and you're in DC, you're in Baltimore, you're in Wilmington, you're in Philadelphia, you're in Boston, you're in Chicago, there's a year up there, please reach out to them at least get to know them, build a relationship. They have two cohorts a year. They, I think they come out like in February and, and August when the, when the internships are, when they're ready. Um, you know, and that may vary locality to locality. That's the Baltimore one. But I would encourage you, reach out to Year Up. If you want, after this meeting, or after this talk, I'm happy to get in contact with my contacts at Year Up. I can't speak highly enough about this program. It's a fantastic program. Uh, the guy who started it is, I mean, I don't get motivated by much. I'm kind of an asshole. Um, I, I really um, am probably more wrapped up in myself than I should be. This guy is humbling to listen to talk to. Like he is, I mean, the guy who started Year Up is really, really an amazing cat. So with that, um, information security is a lot of fun. So is fly fishing, even if you're not catching fish. So um, my advice to you, um, especially for those of you that are kind of getting started, find the stuff that you love, you know, fly fishing, if it's the gear, if it's the flies, if it's the traveling to exotic locales, like, you know, focus on that. If you're in security, you know, if you're a forensic analyst or whatever, you know, do the stuff that you like doing. Um, I've discovered, as much as I like standing around in water and not catching fish, I really like tying flies. Um, I had the fly tying workshop earlier today. I'm not very good at it, but I enjoy it. It's very relaxing to me. Um, I feel like I actually get to build something. I mean, it's not, and we do stuff in cyber all the time, and all you see is like, I have a bunch of files somewhere in like a web page or something like that. Like I have a bunch of little hooks that I tied stuff to that fish sometimes want to eat. I think it's kind of cool. Um, and, and for me, I mean, as much as I like to fish, I'm busy, I don't have a lot of time, but I can do that 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, sit down and tie some flies and, and enjoy things. So um, anyway, um, with that, I don't know if there's any questions. Because <laughs> she looks skeptical, but <laughs> I told you I was going to close with it. You're like, oh, that's OK, but <laughs> yeah, second bear trap. I got a bear trap on each foot. <laughs> All right, sweet. Well, um, thanks for playing along with this little science experiment. If anyone does have any feedback on, on how to make these two topics tie together better than I did, I'd appreciate it. So thanks all. <laughs>